We're hoping to have the uh, federal government respond to our letter, number one, but more importantly, re respond to the inquiry itself. Tonight, an open letter to Minister Bennett demanding action on the MMIWG calls for justice. It's going to allow us to have the Indigenous Law Degree Program integrated into the law school. The University of Victoria's Indigenous Law Program gets $27 million to make space for more students. Learn in their language and in their culture and in their atmosphere, but to be supported as well as they are. And a Cree bilingual school in Saskatchewan is getting a new home. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. It's been well over a year since the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls released its final report. Today, a letter signed by more than 1,500 academics and allies was sent to Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett, criticizing the government for failing to act on the inquiry's calls for justice. J.B. Pashagumscum has more. Kim Anderson is Métis and an associate professor at the University of Guelph, where the letter originated. So we thought, well, well, we'll send a letter to Minister Bennett, and we developed a letter and then put it out as an open letter for folks to sign on to. So now we've had over 1,500 people sign on, a lot of them associated with post-secondary, with you know, scholarship scholars and allies, but community folks um, as well. Anderson says they felt it was time to hold the government accountable for its responsibilities to the inquiry and to let them know that they are watching. We're hoping to have the uh, federal government respond to our letter, number one, but more importantly, re respond to the inquiry itself and to be accountable in particular to the families that participated in the inquiry. Carolyn Bennett has stated that COVID-19 is the reason for the government's delay responding to the calls for justice. Vivian Jimenez Estrada is Mayan from Guatemala and the Department Chair of Sociology at Algoma University in Sault Ste. Marie. She says, despite the pandemic, the government could still be prioritizing justice for Indigenous women and girls. Oh, I don't believe that COVID uh, is really an excuse to not address the issues of underfunding, chronic underfunding in the healthcare system, in the criminal justice system, in developing, uh, you know, ways that actually make sense to Indigenous communities uh, to address uh, all of the root causes of violence. A statement from Bennett's office says the government is employing innovative ways to continue the work of co-developing a national action plan staying physically isolated. This important work is ongoing. The letter also calls on all levels of government to develop local responses to the TRC calls to action in partnership with Indigenous peoples. It says inaction further perpetuates and reinforces systemic violence against Indigenous women and girls. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa. The federal government announced today it will not fight certification of two class action lawsuits. The, la the, la the actions were put forward by the Xavier Mushroom Class Council and the Assembly of First Nations. They seek compensation for now adult children harmed during the deliberate underfunding of the child welfare system. The certification of the lawsuit could mean quicker settlements for victims. Coast Salish torts, Chilcotin contracts, Anishinaabek constitutional law. These are a few of the courses offered by the University of Victoria's Indigenous Law Program. Today, it got a huge boost, a $27 million investment that will give the program a home of its own. One that, as Todd Lamarand explains, began just two years ago. The Indigenous Law Program was launched in 2018. Back then, two Indigenous legal scholars, John Burroughs, and to his right, Val Napoleon, took center stage as co-founders. On Wednesday, Napoleon could not hold back her enthusiasm for this latest development. It's really, really exciting, and that's what I want. Uh, that's what I want to share with you and uh, and others. The University of Victoria will be getting a 2,440 square meter addition to its law building, a national center for Indigenous laws, that will house classrooms, offices, a lecture hall, and room for 100 students. 
And it's going to allow us to have the Indigenous Law Degree Program integrated into the law school. And it's going to, um, you know, we don't want it to be, you know, a separate silo. What we want it to be is an integral, integral part of the rest of the law school. So These students are from the initial intake into the program two years ago, participating in a field school. Napoleon hopes they'll graduate, go out and get jobs, and change the national conversation about Indigenous law. Here are our legal processes. Here is how we uh, apply it to this particular problem. This is a legitimate decision about that particular problem. Right now, what's happening is that people are telling each other what the law is. Napoleon wants Indigenous law to be taken as seriously as common law. So conflicts like the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs versus natural gas pipeline developers can be resolved in a way that's considered legitimate. I hope what, what we'll see is a getting past these kinds of uh, reactionary conflicts where Indigenous peoples are forced into these positions of, of reacting against uh, relations of power which are oppressive. The new building will have Coast Salish designs, signage and public art. But the process of talking to architects has just begun, so it's not clear when shovels will hit the ground. Paul Lamaran, APTM National News, Ottawa. Mi'kmaq chiefs of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland elected a new regional chief today. Four candidates were considered to represent East Coast communities at the Assembly of First Nations. Chief Paul Prosper of Buckingham First Nation will serve as regional chief until 2023. He replaces Morley Gugu, who was removed as regional chief last fall amid allegations of discrimination and harassment. A group of Indigenous protesters interrupted a controversial speech being delivered by former Conservative Party leader Andrew Scheer. It was in front of a statue of John A. Macdonald. Indigenous lives matter! Shear was speaking in Regina this morning when he was interrupted. He was there with two other MPs to celebrate the, quote, positive contributions of the country's first prime minister. Protesters say McDonald represents genocide, the genocide of indigenous peoples. Protests are breaking out in Rochester, New York, over the death of Daniel Prude following an encounter with police in March. The unrest comes after new police body cam video was released and a warning that some images in this story are disturbing. Why was this incident covered up? Why the obfuscation? Activists are calling for murder charges to be laid in Prude's death. He died on March 30th, seven days after the encounter with Rochester police. In the images, officers can be seen placing a spit hood over Prude's head and allegedly pressing his face to the pavement for two minutes. Prude's family held a press conference yesterday shortly after the video was released. I placed a phone call for my brother to get help, not for my brother to get lynched. Now when I say get lynched, that was a full-fledged, ongoing murder, cold-blooded. The man is defenseless, butt naked on the ground. He's a cuffed up already. I mean, come on. How many more brothers got to die for society to understand that this needs to stop? The city halted its investigation into Prude's death after the state attorney began its own investigation in April. A one-of-its-kind heritage facility has broken ground in northern Alberta. Details after the break. Here's a look at your Friday weather forecast starting on the east coast. Sunny in 21 in St. John's. Showers and 25 for Halifax. Rain in Nain with a high of 16. Showers and 23 for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Same temperature for Montreal. 18 with showers for Saguenay. 22 under the sun in Toronto. 20 and showers for Ottawa. 17 with showers for Thunder Bay. 14 and rain for Sioux Lookout. 11 with showers for Churchill, 14 and rain for God's Lake. 20 under sunny skies in Winnipeg, 
18 in Barron's River. 23 for Saskatchewan and Sunny. Sunny and 24 for North Battleford. 14 and Sunny in Uranium City. 17 with rain for La Ronge. Welcome back. The McMurray Métis in Northern Alberta broke ground on a $22 million cultural center that will showcase Métis culture to the world. Chris Stewart has the details. Members of the McMurray Métis were all smiles as leaders and politicians held a groundbreaking ceremony for the new Métis Cultural Center in Fort McMurray. McMurray Métis CEO Bill Lewitt says the center will be the new hub for the Métis in the area. 35,000 square foot feet, we're going to, you know, it's going to be um, a different, uh, uh, there'll be a museum, there'll be, uh, you know, different uh, areas that, uh, where we'll be able to uh, show our rich history in the area. Uh, there'll be theaters, there'll be amphitheater. The center will be located at McDonald Island, built in the shape of the Métis symbol. The federal government is providing $16.5 million dollars with the McMurray Métis funding the rest. Brian and Fiant helped get the project off the ground. Of he says the top of the building will be special ones, with uh, a greenhouse. Ladies are out right now and with the, with the uh, people from the University of Alberta looking at a number of natural, uh, natural plants that grow in this area and how can we harvest them to regrow them and replant them uh, to, to be able to use and access some medicines and herbals and food. The location is near where a Métis community called Moccasin Flats were evicted and their homes destroyed by the municipality during the 70s and 80s to make way for development. Bill Lewitt says this is a step towards reconciliation. Uh, we felt it was a good opportunity to use this as an example of uh, uh, truth and reconciliation. We went out, we got the truth. Um, and we uh, give an opportunity for the municipality to, uh, you know, take a look at this and, and see if we could work on something together. Construction begins next spring with a hoped completion date of 2023. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. The Manitoba Métis Federation broke ground today too on a new housing project in Portage of Prairie. The Willow Bay Housing Development will provide affordable, quality housing for Métis citizens living in Portage. Once finished, it will include a triplex for Métis families and two duplexes for Métis seniors. Senior housing units will be fully accessible with ramps, large doors and grab bars. The investment by the Federation is much needed. According to the latest data from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, Demand for housing in Portage of Prairie is high and is only expected to grow. Back in 1967, the Manitoba Métis Federation was founded and one of the first principles, one of the first issues that was so important to the Métis people back then was housing. And even today, in 2020, we still see housing to be uh, as important, if not one of the most important issues for our people, for our nation today. Construction is expected to be completed in early 2021. Just down the street from my old house. A first of its kind federal food surplus program will distribute millions of pounds of fish to 75 indigenous communities in Manitoba and Saskatchewan and the north. As Daryl Stranger tells us, Fisher River Cree Nation has received millions of dollars to help deliver the freshwater fish sure is that they get uh, fresh nutritious food in this case fish uh, that would have otherwise uh, uh, been wasted the surplus food rescue program is a new initiative by the canadian government to support canada's food system the freshwater fish marketing corporation stopped purchasing fish in march as a result of the covid 19 pandemic now Fisher River Cree Nation will receive over $10 million to purchase and deliver over 1 million pounds of fish from Canada's inland lakes. COVID is a difficult time for everybody. The restaurants shut down, the markets shut down, so a lot of the producers, the Manitoba fishers, had all this fish that they could not sell. So working with Freshwater Fish Marketing Corp, uh, who purchased, with the help of our government, 
uh, in the case of uh, Manitoba, uh, over $10 million worth of fish from fishers that would otherwise be unsold. Fisher River and their partners had lots of walleye on hands to ensure the surplus fish is able to get to northern and indigenous communities, which is why they received the money. Deliveries to Fisher River and Peguas First Nation have already been made, with each on-reserve member getting between one and five kilograms of freshwater fish. The fishermen may not make profit, but Vandal says it will ensure they can continue to fish in the future. Uh, I believe they're not making profit, but they're getting their expenses paid. It's going to allow them to remain whole and allow them to continue fishing uh, into the future. Uh, basically applying, uh, applying uh, using their profession, their skills, continuing to catch fish and continuing uh, uh, their, their way of life. So. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. We have a rare positive pandemic story to tell you about now. Doctors have discovered a new life-saving treatment for seriously ill COVID-19 patients. It's effective, inexpensive and readily available. CTV's medical specialist Avis Favreau explains. Steroids are saving the lives of those seriously ill with COVID-19, according to seven studies done in record time and published quickly by the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's an extraordinary accomplishment and, and, and achievement. With data showing the drugs dexamethasone and hydrocortisone are powerful tools for the front lines. Well, I think it's a significant finding. I think this is by far the most um, promising results we've had of any study of an intervention for COVID-19. The studies show the drugs reduce the risk of death in patients in hospital and on oxygen by 34% over standard medical care, saving the life of one in every 12 patients treated. This is an intervention that uh, costs a matter of dollars uh, to use, not thousands of dollars. Number two, it is widely available. It can be uh, uh, accessed in virtually any country in the world. World health officials immediately issued treatment guidelines, urging doctors around the globe to use these medications, which seem to work by calming down an immune system sent into overdrive by the virus. And I think steroids uh, are very good at decreasing that inflammatory component and reducing the, the damage and the effects of hyperinflammation in the body. The drugs weren't tested on patients with milder forms of COVID-19, and so they can't be recommended for these cases. Still, the news is a sign that doctors are getting a better handle on treating the more severe forms of this disease. Avis Favreau, CTV News, Toronto. Still to come, a funding boost for a special school in Saskatchewan. Stick around. Here's a look at the rest of your Friday weather forecast being back up in northern Alberta. 20 in Peace River, 18 and sunny for Fort McMurray. 30 degrees and sunny for Medicine Hat and Lethbridge, 24 in Edmonton. 24 under sunny skies for Vancouver and Victoria, 33 in Kamloops. 19 in Fort Nelson and Smithers, 15 for Dease Lake. 14 in Old Crow, 15 in Whitehorse. 19 and sunny for Fort Liard and Trout Lake. 11 in rain for Yellowknife. 4 in Saks Harbor. 8 for Politech. 10 with showers in Baker Lake and Arviette. 3 in Cambridge Bay. 0 in Resolute. 6 in Aglula. Welcome back. A unique Cree bilingual school in Saskatoon is so popular, they ran out of room for students. But yesterday, the school received some good news. Priscilla Wolf has the story. It has been over 10 years since St. Francis Cree bilingual school opened its doors in Saskatoon. But they are in an old building that was built in 1953. The school was overcrowded because of the high demand of parents wanting to send their children to a Cree bilingual school that focuses on Indigenous culture. But now that success can continue because St. Francis School will be getting a brand new home. Saskatoon Tribal Council Tribal Chief Mark Arcan says the new school will be a great addition to Saskatoon and the Indigenous community here. Our parents that have advocated for a new school for many, many years 
and to Gord Wine for listening to the parents about the vision of what, what we want for Indigenous children inside of a new school. Deputy Premier and Education Minister Gordon Wyant announced the $34.5 million funding for a brand new school for St. Francis. Wyant adds that the design of the new school will include full engagement from the community to make sure it fits their needs. One of the most important things when we, when we go to build any school is community community input and making sure that, uh, especially with respect to this facility, that it's going to be uh, culturally appropriate. Currently, because of overcrowding, St. Francis School is in two different locations. Diane Boyko, who sits on the Board of Education for Greater Catholic Schools, says enrollment has been high since they started the Cree Bilingual School in 2007. The new school will have a capacity for 700 students from pre-K to grade 8 and she believes it will be the only one of its kind. The trust that parents have put into uh, our division to ensure that there is that opportunity for their children to not only learn in their language and in their culture and in their atmosphere, but to be supported as well as they are. And so uh, we believe we're the biggest Cree bilingual school in uh, all of Canada. We know that for sure, and we believe possibly in the whole world. The plan is to have the new St. Francis Cree bilingual school built and open for classes in the fall of 2023. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Saskatoon. The summer wrapping up, we are fast approaching a brand new season of some of your AP10 news favorites. AP10 investigates, nation to nation, face to face, and in focus, we'll all be back the first week of October. In focus, host Melissa Bridgen gives us a look at an episode the team is working on exploring Indigenous cuisine. We're here in the kitchen of Feast Bistro in the heart of Winnipeg where we'll get a new twist on some old favorites like fish and game. Here's Steve Spence. So the dish I'm going to be preparing today, I'm going to call it Our Sister and I'm going to dedicate it to uh, missing and murdered women across our nation. So I'm going to be working with, with corn. That's one of the three sisters. I'm also going to be doing pickerel. That's a white fish. It's also good for you. All the ingredients are basic items you likely already have on hand or can easily source, and a change from the usual fried fish we all love. Michael Fossen of Urbanski offers up so, this recipe using bison, nice but you could use beef or wild game that you have on hand. Cream, pasta, and if you have it, gorgonzola cheese make this Metis Italian dish delish. These are just some of the cooks and dishes that we'll introduce you to. Be sure to join us for an all-new season of APTN In Focus, Wednesdays at 3 Eastern, 2 Central, beginning October 7th. It's going to be an exciting fall with all the shows returning. That's your APTN National News for this Thursday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.